wonderful lunch this afternoon. I enjoyed my lunch, and I'm sure you all enjoyed your lunch as well. The Lord has helped us. We're going to begin with hymn number 272. 272 to reconvene our conference. <clears throat> Revive thy work, O Lord, and so We open with a word of prayer. O oh, blessed God and our Father, this afternoon we would return thee thanks for the wonderful gift of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us, in him all fullness dwells. And we read this morning of the disciples, how they were glad when they saw the Lord. Their hearts were rejoicing in his presence. And so this afternoon, we too could say that we too are glad when we see the Lord in his majesty and in his Two thousand years ago, Father God, thy beloved Son was crucified. Contain him. And so on the third day, we see the kind of beloved Son by resurrection. Thou hast raised him from the dead and thou hast given him a name that is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow and so how we would rejoice by faith as we look up this afternoon and see him there on the right hand of majesty when we contemplate him in his glories our hearts are revived our hearts are refreshed, our hearts are encouraged for who he is and for what he has done. We give thee thanks for having helped us in the first uh, two Bible studies this morning. And now we would commit ourselves to thee for this, this afternoon's study, study number three. We ask that the Holy Spirit of God would, would direct us and 
reveal the deep things of Christ to our hearts and that we would be encouraged by the, war, by the water of refreshment, the word of God. We would commit to thee, the speakers this afternoon, we ask a blessing on each word that would be pronounced. We also pray for receptive hearts, that those who are in the midst of thy word this afternoon would, would receive it joyfully and that there would be fruit born for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We thank thee for the help you have given. Number three, and Brother Eli will read the scriptures for us, and then Brother Shireen would give us a brief introduction. Brother Eli. Well, we'll start with uh, Psalm 51, verse 10, well-known verse, you probably quote it. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. And then we go to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2. Lord, I have, heard, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And then 17 to 19, same chapter. Through the fig tree, though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit. On the vines, though the. And John, John 14, 1 to 11, do not let your heart be troubled, tro troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also, and you know the where you you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, "Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way?" Jesus, Jesus said, said to him, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but through me. If you had, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him." Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is, it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. <clears throat> Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, otherwise because of, otherwise believe because of the works themselves so far. I'm the introduction. Can I put it here? Uh, good afternoon. Hopefully lunch was not too good that it makes you sleepy. Uh, I hope by now we have heard lots of encouragement to tell us that uh, we need to revive. There is a need to change. And I'm afraid in the last message we heard about repentance, we heard about sin, 
And I was just thinking, somebody would say, but I don't see a big sin in my life. Do I need to change? Do I need to revive? Maybe I'm great like this. And uh, I, I, have, I have a verse in my mind I would like to read. Jeremiah 48, 11. Moab has been at ease since his youth. He has also been undisturbed like wine on its dredge. And he has not been taken emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into exile. Therefore, it's a very important point here. Therefore, he retains his flavor and his aroma has not changed. And he's giving us a picture here of winemaking. I'm not expert in wine, but my understanding, they put it in a barrel for a certain period of time. All the bad things, the imperfections will go to the bottom, and then they empty it from this barrel to another one, and so on. And as you go through this process, the wine gets finer and sweeter and better with all the impurities removed. But if I stay as I am, then my aroma, and here is a bad aroma, bad smell, will stay on me. Who doesn't need to change? The Lord Jesus, God, because he's perfect. There is nothing better to do. I am born with sin, you are born with sin. We become, come to the Lord and accept him as our Lord and Savior, and he keeps changing us. So the need to change is there. And when you go to the, Old, in the New Testament, we hear this word about be transformed by the renewal of your mind. There is a command that we need to be transformed. And, and we hear about the fact that we are all are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Are you part of we are all? If you are, then you need to be transformed. But then... We need to keep a balance. Change is not just for the sake of change because somebody would, would argue that, okay, things should stay as is. Don't move the ancient boundaries. Don't change things. So how do we keep the balance? The apostle advises us that we should, should examine everything, hold fast to that which is good. What's included in everything? Everything. Examine everything. Examine what you believe in the Bible that will make you hold fast to it. Examine human traditions that allows you to get rid of it. When you examine everything, you will be able to discern what to keep and what to hold fast to. So we are called to change. And that's why uh, David here have this cry, renew, I want that new heart, this renew a right spirit within me. But he was sinning, right? So he is coming from repentance. But at the same time, we hear that similar cry from Paul when he says, I forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the price of the upward call for God in Jesus Christ. He's not forgetting his past as a Pharisee. He's not get, forgetting his past as a sinner. No, he's forgetting his uh, ministry, his glories, everything great he's doing because he is moving forward. He is changing. He's longing to move from glory to glory. So that idea of change is critical. And I hope we, have, we can establish that from the Bible. Now we have in front of us two pictures from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. From Habakkuk, that desire for revival, and from the Gospel of John, that message about encouragement. And if we start with Habakkuk, uh, he was disturbed. He was a prophet living and looking around him in sinful conditions. He's seeing evil winning and he was perplexed, like Job when he was perplexed in his trial, like Jeremiah when he was perplexed in the moral, the moral conditions of the nation of Israel. He was perplexed and he went to the Lord crying, why this is happening? How do you let your people in this misery? 
And the Lord started communion, communion with him. He started sharing and discussing with him. And he revealed to him great revelations, telling him, listen, I'm getting the Chaldeans as a tool to uh, chastise my people. And at the end, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Great things. And at the end, now we get to chapter 3, where he gets that, that peak uh, praise point, and he starts asking the Lord, revive us, revive your, your people. And then he starts listing different things that the Lord can do. And at the end, he doesn't come to the fact that, yes, I am happy because there is a revival coming, but he says, I can be happy because the Lord is my salvation. I'm happy in him. And let me suggest that revival does not start in a meeting or in a nation, but start in your heart and in my heart. Start by individual. When we go to heaven, we will not come as a group. This is the meeting from Markham. This is the meeting from Davenport. This is Willowdale. Oh, blessed are those people that dwells among the, the brethren assemblies. No, we'll start as individuals. Every one of us will stand based on what we believed, based on what we have done, based on how we lived. We are here to encourage one another, but the revival starts by individuals, by you and me. And then let me suggest three things that we can learn here from Habakkuk. Based on his communion with God, he got three things that tells us how you can get into that great point of revival. The first one is, Communion with God gives us strength. And in the Psalms, we read a lot about the God who equipped me with strength. That's like Psalm 18, 32. But here Habakkuk is not talking about the strength that I get from God. But he's saying, the Lord God is my strength. He is my strength. I'm not looking for a genie to give me power. I'm not looking for somebody to provide my needs or help me in my trials. But I'm looking for him as the person that can be my strength. He will not give me something to make me powerful, but I'll just cling to him and he is the powerful one. And that enables Paul later to say, I can do all things, not because I'm powerful now, not because he gave me strength, but through him who strengthened me. Clinging to the Lord gives you strength. That's the powerful thing that you can get for revival. The second thing we understand is God gives light-footedness, the ability to have the feet of the hinds. He says, he had made my feet like hinds' feet. And, and contrast the hinds' feet or the deer's feet with the, with the cow's feet or the camel's. They are small, fast, swift they don't stick to the ground you can jump quickly through them and do we hear about feet in the new testament yes we hear about in, in ephesians 6 he says as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace the feet need to be ready to move and to react and that that speaks of the holy spirit moving us I discovered as I grow older that I have my own routines, my own preferences, my own stiffness. It's not easy to change things in me, but we're called to change. And that means we need to have that feet of the hinds to be directed by the Holy Spirit quickly. Can I change my job? Can I change my role? Can I change my ministry? I need to have that ear to hear and listen. The Lord would like to have revival, but who are willing to do that? Who is ready to do that? It's you and me. We need to have that mobility, swiftness, readiness, so that we can change course quickly as the Holy Spirit can lead us. The third thing is you get into elevation and makes me walk on my high places. If it's up to me, I would say, Lord, this is hard. Why don't you just remove the mountains? Make it easy. Why do we have to go through the troubles? Just remove it. You are mighty. You can change things. You, you made the Israelites go through the sea. 
you gave them food. That's amazing. Why get us through the trouble? That's part of the revival. And this is what Habakkuk celebrated. He made me go high. And just picture the hinds up in the mountain, having pure air away from the predators and the danger. Uh, to survive there, they have to coordinate very uh, carefully how they move because they are on the cliffs. Any wrong movement can cause disaster. But the picture and the atmosphere there is very different. And the same for us. We can easily avoid trouble. We can easily avoid problems. But we live in an earth that's full of trouble. We are humans. We are full of trouble. We can cause trouble to one another. And the Lord is saying, I will make you go over this trouble. That will make you stronger. That will make you uh, more powerful. That will make you closer to me. And that's the true revival. Not to avoid the mountains, but to go above them. Am I longing to that position? Or do I prefer to live in the valley where things are easy and smooth and there is no problem there? So Habakkuk gives us the idea that revival starts with communion with the Lord that gives us strength. He gives us different kind of feet and agility and he makes us go above our mountains. Now, if we switch to John, and the Lord here talks to the disciples in, in the last uh, hours, and he says, he'd give them three things. But before I get to the three things, he give them, the starting point is, you are getting into trouble. You have troubled heart. What is the solution? I'll give you some... Uh, Therapy, I'll, uh, I'll give you some uh, sauna or relaxation or give you some encouragement or some guards to, to help you. No, the solution for troubled heart is me. Solution, you have troubled heart, believe, you believe in God, believe also in me. And, and we all know that the, the opposite of fear in the Bible is faith. And, and that's true for them and at that time and true for us now. When we have faith, we will not have troubled heart. And when we have troubled heart, we have nothing to do but to run to the Lord in faith. But then he gave them three things that can comfort them as he's leaving them. The first one, he's giving them invitation to the Father's house. The second one, he is telling them about the inhabitants of the Father's house. And the third one, he is telling them about the way to the Father's house. The first one is about invitation to the Father's house. He's saying, listen, I have good news. There is a Father's house that has many places. Okay, Lord, great, but this is the Father's house. What does it have to deal with us? Well, he's telling me, I'll go to, to the cross to prepare you to the Father's house. But then I'm going to prepare the Father's house to you by opening it i will go not as the son of man or the son of god but i'll go as a man going there and i will this way i will open the father's house to all other men that have my nature i am the head and i will get the rest of my body to the father's house so by his cross he wiped away the guilt but by going to heaven and sending the Holy Spirit, he made us ready to go to the Father's house. And by him as a man entering the Father's house, he opened the Father's house to a new race because now we belong to the Father. He wasn't our Father before, but by the Lord going there and sending the Holy Spirit, now we can call him Abba, Father. What a great invitation. We're not invited to escape from hell but we are invited to be sons of God. That's a great privilege that sometimes we forget. The second thing he is telling, him, telling them about the Father's house, great Lord, so we're going to the Father's house, tell us, does it have like golden floor or, or marble everywhere? Will we just have food unlimited? What is there that's really amazing us for us? By saying, you know what's amazing? I'll be there. 
so that wherever I'll be, you will be. What else? Oh, there's nothing else. It doesn't matter. What matters is I will be there and you will be with me. And that's the beauty of, of the Christian faith. It's as simple. We started the first session saying we go to the Lord for, for rest and refreshments. Guess what? To end in revival and, and uh, encouragement, we need to go to the Lord. In our journey here, Habakkuk discovered that revival starts with the close communion with the Lord. And in our eternal life, it will be amazing because we will have that strong communion with the Lord. And then he tells them, you know the way. And what is the way? He said it very specific. I am the way. He is the way to the Father's house. In the first session, there were some invitations. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, he is the way to the Father's house. And I repeat that invitation not to escape from hell, not to go to heaven, but to go to the Father's house. What a great privilege. But also for us, we have to remember that we are saved just because of what the Lord has done. We are going there, not because... I'm good, not because I belong to a specific meeting or part of a specific family, not because of my ministry or service, but because of him. He is the way, and there is no other way. I'm sure the brothers will have more to expand on for Habakkuk and uh, John, uh, but my prayer is to think about the personal responsibility. In many cases, we are like Habakkuk. We say the conditions are awful around us, and we wait for revival to start so that I can join the revival. But things will not improve. You know, if we are perfect, the Lord would come and, and things will end. But this is a journey, and the revival starts with me. The revival starts with you. Do you think Habakkuk's condition changed at the end of chapter 3? No. If you look from outside, you say it's like he just wasted his time, he wrote a nice poem, and that's it. But no, he enjoyed the true revival in spite of what's around him. Can we enjoy that? We are at the end time, we believe, and things will not improve. But we can enjoy personal revival. We can enjoy small revivals in our meetings if we start by you and me. Amen. Well, here is your memory verses for the conference. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, and the labor of the oil shall fail, the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, there shall be no herd in the stall, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He shall make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places. Now at the end of the conference, each one is going to recite those verses. It's amazing. <clears throat> Everywhere he turns, it's a drought, barrenness. There is nothing. The pocket is empty. The house is caving down. No job. The children are not doing very well. And the school are complaining from them. And everywhere he turns is terrible. But then he turns to the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. I think it reminds us <clears throat> of Job. If you read the story of Job, I think it's very much like this. One after the other, uh, the flock uh, and the whatever, and then the children, and then himself, and all this. And his wife says to him, turn, curse God and, and live. What are you hanging on to? So you speak like a, a foolish woman. 
Shall we receive the good from God's hand and not the bad? And I think this is what, <clears throat> what this uh, prophet is doing. And if we look at ourselves, what happens when we have a problem? I think the first thing we do is to complain. And then to find someone to accuse him of the problem. And uh, to raise, you know, a spirit of, of uh, complain. That's not what, what Habakkuk is doing, not at all. And he didn't even look at himself, how can he improve all these things? This is another thing we try to do. But immediately he looks at the Lord. He's not discouraged. What a man. You know, we spoke earlier about the Lord in um, Matthew 11. No discouragement at all. I thank you, Father. And this is what Habakkuk is learning to do. I will rejoice in the Lord. No, it's not that he's saying, I'm still content, but he's still rejoicing. The condition in, in John 14 is different. In John 13, the Lord, with an unexpected way, he uncovered their sinfulness. One of you is going to betray me. And they were troubled. They looked at one another and said, oh, is he going to be this one? One of the Gospels says they started to think, who is he that is going to betray him? And the other Gospel says that they doubted in themselves. Lord, is it I? Am I the one who is going to betray you? They were troubled. And then at the end of, the, of uh, chapter 13, he looks at Peter, a leader among them. Before the, the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. And you know, it's just like a cold water fell upon this man. He says, uh, if everybody will deny you, not me. But then he says, you are going to deny me. I deny me. It was a trouble, you know, l l like a dark cloud on the little company. And there are probably some silence. And the Lord breaks the silence. Let not your heart be troubled. He is the only one that can dismiss such a trouble. And they know, they know that he is able to dismiss any trouble. They have experiences over and over again. When they were in the ship, and it says that the ship was about to sink. And he wasn't sleeping in the ship. And he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the sea. And they marvel. What, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So when he tells them, let not your heart be troubled. It dismisses the trouble right away. You know, if I tell you that not be troubled, I'm just as troubled as you are. But if the Lord tells them and us this, he is the one that is able to turn every trouble. As this man is saying, you will make my feet like hinds feet. You will make me to walk on my high places, as Eugene mentioned, those mountains, put them under my feet. And then he comforts them, as we have heard, with these things. I go to prepare a place, and some Christian says, Lord, you've been preparing the place for 2,000 years. That's not the case, of course. We all know that. The place is prepared. I go, where is he going? To the cross. He goes to the cross to prepare them and us to the place. And then he goes to heaven to prepare heaven for us. And both things are done. The work is finished. We're only waiting for him. I will come again and receive you unto myself. 
And I like Thomas, although we spoke about him, he was absent later on from the company. But Thomas is the one that is very plain. If he doesn't know anything, he's going to ask the Lord. He's not going to imitate that he knows, you know, or embarrassed to ask. Maybe they will discover that. I think all of them didn't know. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how do we know the way? Only to bring these beautiful, you know, statements of the Lord. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And again, again, we say there is no blessing outside of him. He's the only way to the Father. You know, we speak to some Muslim people. And they say, well, we, 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 we all believe in the same God. I said, no, no. No, no. There's only one way. You don't know the Lord. You have no way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And thank the Lord for each one who, who believes on the Lord. You know the way. And then Philip asked the question, show us the Father, and it suffices us. He says, no, you're not. That I am in the Father. We are going to see the Father? We are. He that had seen me had seen the Father. And the time is coming when we shall see him as he is. And in him we are going to see the Father. I am in the Father and the Father in me. What a joy, dear brethren. It is for our encouragement on this terrible way that we're going through? Yes. There's trials on every side? Yes. But let us rejoice in the Lord, and joy in the God of our salvation. We know the story in 2 Samuel chapter 12 when David sinned against Bathsheba. The verse that we have here about the Bible in Psalm 51 and verse 10. We know the background here, even the heading of Psalm 51 kind of reminds us I just read the headings there a little bit. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. We know uh, David was trying to hide his sin during that time. We know we have that a little bit in the Psalm 32. And also Psalm 32 also reminds us about the, the joy of receiving forgiveness from the Lord. We know Nathan, when he approached David, when David tried to hide his sin, David kind of gave him a little bit of a variable in the beginning there. I don't have to uh, touch all of them. You can just read it in first, 2 Samuel chapter 12. You can read it at home, the, the full story. And by the way, we know when David, after he had given this parable, David said to Nathan, oh, Nathan, whether he point his finger at David, I believe Nathan is one of the bravest men as recorded for us in the scriptures. Imagine uh, pointing your finger to the king. Nathan said to him, you are the man, David. In verse 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we also record that after Nathan mentioned a few things to David. And, and Nathan said to him in verse 13, David said, I have sinned. And uh, Nathan said to him, David, you will not die. 
I believe David uh, sinned unto death here. He's basically dying. You know, we have that in First John chapter 5, right? There is a sin unto death. So basically, David is, uh, is dying, just like we recorded in Psalm 32. And he said to him, you will not die. Then we come to Psalm 51. Notice David is not trying to cover his sin here now in Psalm 51. You know, you notice here, even in verse 10 that we read here, create in me clean heart, O God, and renew a step of spirit within me. You know, the word me here in Psalm 51 mentioned about 15 times. And the word my mentioned about 13 times. And the word I mentioned about seven times. You notice that? David is not trying to blame someone, but is basically acknowledging his sin before the Lord. We have that in uh, Proverbs chapter 28, remember? He that cover up his sin shall not prosper, right? So David here now is now covering up his sin. Uh, the, the Lord knows. Maybe some of us here trying to cover your sin. The brother remind us, uh, you know, revival begins with me. Revival begins with you. I remember the song one time, one of the spiritual songs. Is me, is me, oh Lord, need a real prayer? Not my mother, not my father, but it's me. Oh Lord, right? Don't blame anyone. You know, the problem of the world today is blaming the Palestinian, the Palestinian blaming Israel and this and all blaming each other, right? That's why we have so much trouble in the world. You know, there's nothing new about that. Remember in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? Adam blamed his wife. He even blamed God. The woman you give me. He not only blamed his wife, but also blamed God, right? And the woman also blamed Satan. Blaming, blaming. But David basically he acknowledges sin. You know what happened when you and I acknowledge your sin? All of a sudden, no longer me, no longer I or my. Then all of a sudden, yours. Then God comes in the scene. Yours is mentioned about 24 times. If I miss something, just uh, let me know. You know, sometimes when you get old, you miss a little bit here and there, right? That's why I just got a new glasses, <laughs> trying to uh, count everything uh, properly, you know. But it's quite a few. See, notice here it says in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to your multitude, tender mercy. I'm not going to go to all the you here. And it says here in verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and have done this evil in your sight. You know, sin is always complicated, no? You use a lot of different words here. You use sin, you use transgression, you use evil. 
There are many other, I think it's about four different words that they use to describe sin. You know, sin is always complicated. At the end of the portion of the scripture here, in verse 19, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer both on your altar. You know, other will be affected. Right? Other will be affected. If you start on us, people around us, we notice there's something different with this person. Something. And David also can say, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the step of spirit within me. I might as well touch uh, a little bit on this John 14. I might as well. I'm here already. Yeah. Anyway, when you go to John 14, you can turn with the book in John 14 for a minute. I try not to, uh, but you notice there that there's two questions is being asked there. One is asked by Thomas, and the other one is asked by Philip. We know that the word trouble is mentioned many times here in the scriptures. Gospel of John. We know it's already mentioned. I just mentioned chapter 12 for a minute. In the Gospel of John. He was troubled about predicting his dying on the cross, right? In chapter 12. Then very wagly touched it. He was troubled because one of them will betrayed him as Judas Iscariot and he also touched about uh, imagine uh, what, the, what the Lord is going through he had enough trouble already and all this uh, disciples causing more trouble you know all of them forsake him and pledge right But the Lord Jesus is in control. He knows everything that's going on, right? That's the reason he came to this world, because of his great love for you and me. And it's only the way of the cross that you and I can be saved. Without the cross, there's no hope for you and me. Even in this Easter time, to be reminded again and again, the reason the Lord Jesus came to this world to die for us but he didn't die in vain, we know. He is risen. My Lord is alive. You know, we have a privilege one time to go with Giddy to the tour of Israel. As the highlight of the tour is the going to that tomb where the Lord Jesus was buried. Really give joy to my heart, knowing my Savior is alive. Is alive. Hallelujah. What a savior. You know, we've been singing quite a bit of the Easter song during that time. And Brother John was playing the guitar. He is not here. He is risen. And notice the uh, He began with, let not your heart be troubled. In verse 1. And also in verse 27, he says, Peace I live with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world give it, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Again, repeat it again. 
You know how many times the Father is mentioned here? Again and again, it's just uh, our brother read 1 to, 1 to 11 of John 14. 1 to 11, the Father is already mentioned 11 times during that time. He is my Father. You know how many times the Father is mentioned here in John 14? He mentioned 23 times. In my Father's house are many abiding places. You know, there is room, lots of room. I remember one time I was trying to witness to my, one of my friends at work, and he told me heaven is full already. Lots of people there already. But the Lord Jesus said, in my Father's house, there's plenty of room. Plenty of room. There's plenty of room for you, for me. All you need to do is just, uh, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, what happened? You will be saved with the authority of the word of God. Philippians jail asked the question, what must I do to be saved? You're too late. You cannot do anything to be saved. The Lord Jesus had done it all. All to him we are. All you need to do is to believe. Believe. The Lord Jesus said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God bless his word. I'd like to take these last comments and bring them back to the first study where we began. And we had a, a comment there as to abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ is to be the normal state and condition of the believer. The comment that we've just had with, was with regards to sin. And the subject is a question of revival. We heard that the meaning of revival or to, to revive is, is, is someone who is in a natural sense, if someone has some type of a health condition where they need to be revived, they need to be brought back, or if spiritually, one who is in need of being revived is one who has become separated from God. And that is what sin does. David had a sense of what sin had done in his life. We get that sense from reading this whole psalm. In verse 10, as we've got this before us, create in me a clean heart, O God. I want to go back to verse 7, because there we get a sense of, of what he is desiring, but it's more than what he was desiring. It's also what God does. And I, th this is what I want to emphasize for each one of us. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Job is asked the question, does he know and understand the treasures of the snow? I'm not going to answer that question. I want you to try to explore that because it's, it's wonderful what snow does. But here, what, 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 one of the treasures of snow is that to be whiter than snow. If you take fresh snow and you melt it down and run that snow through cheesecloth, what will you find? You will find a residue, won't you? whiter 
than snow. What I want to emphasize, beloved, is when sin has been dealt with in our life, that we stop dwelling upon it. It's dealt with. And I think sometimes the greater hindrance in full restoration, in full revival, is not the recognition from God's side what he can do, but rather that we do not from our side accept what God says and what he does. And we continue to, shall I say, wallow in misery from our side. David is not doing that in this chapter. What he is desiring to do, rather, is to be restored in his relationship and fellowship with his God. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He wanted to be back into that relationship where he was in New Testament language, abiding in Christ. Where he was, as we read in Habakkuk, in spite of the circumstances around, he could be rejoicing in God. He was no, look, no longer looking at circumstances. He was no longer looking at sin. He was no longer looking at himself. He was rejoicing in his relationship with God, in that love, in that forgiveness, in who God is. And he was living in the good of it. And this is what we need, beloved. It's not just a theoretical, theological understanding of these truths, but an entering into them personally, the reality of it, that our lives might be characterized as abiding in Christ. And then we will find that there's strength and there's power, but not in ourselves but in him. And he's the one who does this work. Create in me a clean heart. And we won't be occupied with, I'm going to use the word the filth, we'll be occupied with Christ. Continue on that line and emphasize we have set before us revival, and we've learned much about what revival is. Said over and over, it begins with me. But we've also just heard, as we read in the scripture, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, that it's the Lord's work, that it's a divine work in my soul. It begins with me at the end of, of verse 2 of chapter 3 of Habakkuk, we were reminded already this morning, in wrath, remember mercy. And we need to come to this point. This is where it begins with me in my repentance and confession before the Lord. And this, when we pray for mercy, what is praying for mercy? To pray for mercy is the acknowledgement that I'm guilty. And that's where it begins with me. I need to acknowledge that. And then I pray to the one who in his loving kindness will extend to me mercy. Then we learn that it's a divine work. Oh Lord, revive whose work? Your work. That's what the scripture says. Revive your work in the midst of years. It's his work. It's a divine work in my soul. For what reason? We put here, rightfully so, revival and encouragement. True, and that's our side. That's our side. That's what we receive. We receive through the divine work of revival, the encouragement, the blessing in our relationship and fellowship with the Lord. But what was the result of that work? We just said it, but that's why I want to stress it. 
Because what is the what is the result of the revival of that took place in Habakkuk? Verse 17 and verse 18 of chapter 3. Right? Verse 17 gives a description of the condition that surrounded them. And it was anything but good. It was the result of the consequences of their failure. All of that existed around them, and it still existed. Now the revival, the prayer for mercy had gone out. The heart was set in right condition and turned towards the loving God who in mercy, who in his kindness would remember mercy, even in his wrath. Because judgment is his strange work. What was the result? First of all, verse 17. The condition that surrounded him, he wasn't occupied with it. He had peace with God, despite the condition. That's number one. Revival brought peace into his own heart, regardless of the condition around. Verse 18 is number two. Then he says, look at the first word, yet. Yet, despite all that's around me, despite the failure and the condition because of the failure, we know it, we see it, we feel it and experience it. We're living it, brothers and sisters. But if he's going to do a work in my heart and in your heart and in our hearts collectively, and we cry to him for mercy, then we can come like the prophet. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. He'd received encouragement, but what was the response? What's the reason for revival? It's not all about me. Yes, the Lord desires to bless in his people. Absolutely. That's his work towards us. But it's so that he receives the praise and he receives the glory. It's about the greatness of who he is. This is what he has, has done and accomplished, not only in redemption, but then to bring us back to himself. His desire is that we would continue to abide and walk with him. For what purpose? To give glory to him. This is what the prophet is doing. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He was rejoicing in him, and that was his heart's occupation, and it, the result was praise to him. And this is the, the natural, and I use that word carefully. I don't mean it by nature. I mean the response of the, of the, of the one who has been redeemed, the, the um, a response of a redeemed heart is to bring praise to the one who is to his redeemer, worship unto his redeemer, thanksgiving unto him. It's about the, the glory of the one who has done the work of revival. It's about the honor of his name and the glory of his name. So, yes, there is encouragement. That's our side. But what's my response? Do I have a heart that's open, that will respond, that's overflowing? Worship is a term, the word, that means to overflow. And is my heart overflowing, indicting a good matter, speaking of the things concerning the king? And that there is that which would flow out from my heart unto him. That he receives the praise and he receives the glory. You see, when I bow in humbleness at, my, at his feet and I plead for mercy, it's not for my glory, but the glory of the one who has done the work of revival. The one who loves us despite the fact of our failure. And that's what brings us to John 14. Because in John 14, again, the hearts of the disciples are troubled. But notice here, three words in John 14. Verse 1, faith. You believe in God, believe also in me. Faith. Verse 2, hope. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, love, that where I am, you may be also. 
abiding in his presence in love. That's who he is. And so it is, again, faith, hope, love, that which glorifies the one who has brought us into relationship with himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now abideth faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Take any one of the, take faith, take love away, and there's no faith. Take love away, there's no hope. But now we have faith, hope, and love united, tied, and knit together in one in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe also in him. This is our encouragement. And what is the result? For his eternal praise in my father's house are many mansions. He's bringing us there that we will be in his presence for his eternal praise and glory. Yes, for our blessing. That's what his delight is to share his love with us. But it's for the glory and praise of his name. May he be worshipped. Keeping in uh, Habakkuk, I have a, a thought with respect to one of the reasons that Habakkuk was able to be revived is if we turn over to chapter 1 of Habakkuk, the book starts with the phrase, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. It started off with a burden. And if I were to put it in today's wording, I would say he was not indifferent. It's not that he couldn't care less. Well, we might take it, uh, some might say, well, he's complaining in verse 2. He's complaining to the Lord and he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? But the thing is that he's talking to the Lord. He's not going to talk to all his friends and saying, these are the problems that we have. He's bringing his burden. He's deeply exercised. And he's coming to the Lord and he's saying, Oh Lord, I have a burden. I have an issue. And I need to bring it before you. I want to be revived. And uh, he says, why, in verse 3, Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to hold, behold grievances? And the Lord answers in verse 4, but he answers in a way that, uh, that Habakkuk did not expect. He says, I'm going to use your enemies to change the situation. He says, for lo, in verse 6, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. And he continues on and he says, this is what I'm going to use to change the situation. And brothers and sisters, maybe the Lord is going to change the situation in a way that we're not expecting. But that's how it's going to become a revival. It's not my way. It's not your way. It's God's way. Let us be flexible to allow the Lord to use His way. And at the end of the book, at the end of the book, the chapter 3 starts off in a totally different way than chapter 1. Chapter 1, it's the burden. Chapter 3, it's a prayer of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was changed, even in spite of asking these questions, in spite of going through this. It changed from a burden to a prayer. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so it's changed totally in his eyes, in his, in his thoughts. And the situation itself is still dire, 
because at the end of that chapter, he says, the fig tree is still not blossoming, although it's still not blossoming. And this is the source. This is the source of their income, maybe. The fruit in the vine, there's no fruit in the vine. The labor of the olive shall fail. The field is not yielding any fruit. There's nothing growing. We're working hard in the field. We're plowing. We're changing everything, but there's no fruit. And how many times do we do our efforts? We're trying as best as we can, but yet we don't see the fruit. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. And we're seeing, we can see that even among, among Christianity, how it's discouraging. And there's no herd in the, in the stall. There's no spare. Nothing that we can go back on and bring it back. But verse 18 is so encouraging. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And I actually love the literal of this. It says, I will jump for joy in the Lord. I will spin around for delight in God. How amazing. All of this dreadful situation, but he says, I will jump for joy in the Lord. And we have talked about joy. In spite of the conditions, in spite of the situations, we can rejoice. Reminds me of uh, Paul in Philippians. How he was going through much turmoil, but he could say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, we re re again, I say rejoice. Amen. May we be encouraged to look to him in spite of the situations. The time is almost up. Just very, very briefly, I feel Habakkuk is giving us a small picture that we can learn from in this uh, last verse of chapter 3. He says that to the chief musician with my stringed instrument. So what he's saying here is that he's picturing the Lord as the chief musician, the manager or the chief of the orchestra, and he is one that playing on a string instrument. So imagine the picture. The maestro and the orchestra, and he is one that playing on the strings. So the, the, the question is, on the strings of my heart, the emotions, the desires, what is filling my heart and making the playing the music in my heart? Is, is it the Lord who is taking control on the instruments and the strings of my heart? Or is it the failure of God's people or the evil around me or the difficulties or the lack of resources are playing on my strings of my heart? I feel this is very unique uh, picture. He's picturing each one of the believers as an instrument. And each of us is playing a melody. I think this is what Paul said in uh, Philippians. That uh, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is what comes out as an echo. But the question is, who is the one and which hands are playing on my heart. I confess, many times, I let circumstances. I get down because I look at what people do. This did that, that did this, and I'm consumed with it. And at the end, I'm playing a very down, sad tune that the Lord is displeased with. But the Lord wants us to get up on our feet and to be praying and praising for him. But he has to take control of the instrument of my heart. He's a maestro taking control. Don't leave this instrument in the hands of anxieties, failure, pain, 
whatever things could be. But let the Lord encourage us. Just briefly, chapter 3. He turned his eyes from the failure of the people. He turned his eyes from the evil people coming against him. He turned his eyes on what is going inside him. And the Lord took his eyes on the Lord himself in chapter 3. The Lord in chapter 3 reminded Habakkuk of what he has done in the past. In chapter 3 verses 3 till probably 8. We look at God came, verse 3 from Timon. Verse 4, he had raised flashing from his hand and there his power was hidden. He stood in verse 6 and measured the earth. He reminded him with the power of the Lord and his mercies in the past to his people. Isn't it encouraging? Then number two, he encouraged him by looking up and seeing what's happening in the future. Verse 9 till verse 16, your bow was made quite ready. Verse 12, you marched through the land indignation. You went forth for the salvation of, and so on. His eyes occupied with the future blessings. And wouldn't this, this would make a big difference, dear brothers, to be reminded of the mercies of the Lord in the past and the promises and the hope of the future. This will give power and encouragement to walk in faith even through difficult times. And this even we can sing and play melody for the Lord even if the circumstances didn't change. Thank you, <clears throat> beloved brethren, for your wonderful exhortations on section number three. Uh, on our schedule right now, uh, I see we have a question period from 315 to 345. I just made a check at the back and I do not see any questions. So what I'm going to do impromptu, if the brethren allows me to, we could sing a hymn in the interim. And if you have a question, please use the time as we sing the hymn to put the questions at the back and then we could readdress the issue. And we also have, um, when do you want to do that? right now okay brother Imad has reminded me as well that we are going to have uh, a blessing of collection in support of the conference so we would sing a hymn and we will pass around the collection box as well and in the meantime if you have a question please feel free to write it down on a piece of paper put it at the back and we will address those questions always remember just uh, kindly, I would say a good question usually begins with the letter W, right? So that we can get grasped what the essence of the question is, what, where, why, would be good starters for questions. Yeah, so we'll pass, we'll sing a hymn right now. If you don't mind, we could sing hymn number 35 and the collections will be collected while we sing the hymn. And at the same time, we could field our questions uh, at the back, and we could answer those questions after the singing of the hymn and the collection of our blessings. Hymn number 35, while we do this, please. Rise, my soul, behold, tis Jesus. Jesus fills thy wandering eyes. Rise, my soul, behold, tis Jesus, Jesus fills our wandering
Amen. We do have questions. More than we can handle. <laughs> Is there a difference between restoration and revival? If so, please elaborate. To restore is to bring back. To revive is to bring back. The I would suggest that when it comes to words in the scripture, we look to the scripture to give us the answer. So we ask, as our brother has just said, restore and revival all have the concept of bringing back something that was there uh, previously. When we look at the chapter that we were last looking at from Habakkuk, he says, revive thy work. And the verb revive means to give life again to something. So reviving the work means to bring it back to a point where its life is manifest. When it comes to restore, it also has the question of bringing back. I will restore the years which the palmer worm and the canker worm and so on and so forth. So it has, both of them have significantly the basis of bringing back, but the scripture makes the distinction, reviving, and I'm just using that verse that we use today, reviving the work, giving it life again, and restoring, he says, I'm going to restore the work. You know something, the only person who can revive or restore is the Lord. I'm not going to say it the way he said it because he said it very eloquently. But to restore something, it's something I have lost. Like um, um, David says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When he sinned, he lost that joy. And also, when we sin, we lose for a while the fellowship with the Father. And that is why he says again, without the word restoration, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What is he going to do? He's going to restore, restore that fellowship back. He's going to work on me to repent, and then he would, he would bring that fellowship back. So they have very close uh, a relationship, very close meaning. For a revival, there must be a restoration of what I have lost. I may be subjected to correction, but 
But I believe Brother Whale mentioned the prodigal son in one of your comments today. I, I was wondering if we see both principles in the prodigal son, where the relationship between the father and the son was broken. It was a broken relationship. And the son went off into a far country living riotously. He wasted, wasted his substance in riotous living, but then he repented. The scripture says clearly that he repented and he returned to the father. And his father greeted him. We know the story very well. Placed a robe on him and, and shoes on his feet, ring on his finger. I, I see in that parable both principles of revival and restoration. There was joy in that house. The father was looking out the window and he's seeing his son returning. This is joy. This is revival of spirit. This is rejoicing. And, and, and I sometimes try to imagine what that household was like when the, when the son showed up and he was welcomed back into the house. There was restoration of relationship and there was revival and rejoicing of spirit. I, I, I hope that helps. I could be wrong. Question number two. What does seek God's face literally mean? What does seek God's face literally mean? Yes, uh, two verses of scripture. Uh, one in Psalm 34, and it says there um, in verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, uh, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hear it. He delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near unto those who are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. So all this can be involved in seeking the face of the Lord, but we must be humble. And the other verse in um, Isaiah 57, where it says in verse 15, for thus said the high and lofty one who inhabited eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him also who is of a contrite and a humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So we see that God has regard, high regard uh, for humility as we uh, seek his face or his presence. I would propose two more verses. Um, Genesis, Genesis chapter four, uh, we see Cain uh, losing that privilege 
in verse 14, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And so we see Cain despising the uh, despising the, uh, the the relationship uh, with God that Abel sought and in his offering, and then we we see a very different um, uh, a very different encounter in Genesis chapter thirty two. And we uh, read verse 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And Jacob contended uh, and, and sought the Lord's blessing. And, uh, and so we see two aspects of seeking in Lord's face and losing that privilege to um, uh, to be in God's presence through, uh, through not seeking his face. So what does it literally mean? What does it literally mean to see his face? And, and I think what we've had set before us has much to do with the relationship where there is where there is, where communion has not been disturbed because of sin. And I, I thinking of this expression face to face, I, the supreme example is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see him in John 1.1, 1, 1, where you read in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, is literally and the word was face to face. They were face to face. Why? They are one. There was nothing. They, they, they were united. They were one. To, so what does this mean literally for us? It is our relationship with him that we are brought into that fellowship and communion where there, has been, where there is nothing that separates me from that fellowship, which is sin, that separates me from the Lord. So to seek his face is to seek that nearness of relationship that it would be so that I would be near unto him. In, and, uh, and that would be ultimately, for the purpose of that is then in testimony in my life. We see this expression also in 1 Corinthians 13, <clears throat> where we maybe again be able to understand from verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. So again, it's now we have an earthly condition where it, there is seeing his face dimly. So we know there's always room for us to grow and understand more and, and in our nearness of relationship and walk with the Lord. It's dim, but it's growing. And, we, and as we see him more and more, we have a more and more appreciation of the glory of his person and all that he is. But then he also sets the heavenly condition before us, but then looking forward face to face. There will be nothing that will come in between. All will be uh, in perfect harmony for his glory. 27 and verse eight. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. I think it means let the the face of the Lord shine on me, his greatness. It means accepting me when he, when he uh, accepts me and look at me. He wants me to see his face. Uh, his, his great light is going to shine on me with acceptance. In the same verse, we had prayer. So let them seek my face, get my acceptance, my approval on them. 
when he said that uh, to, uh, to um, Solomon in his prayer. Um, it's in Psalm 34, verse 5. I understand literally that verse says, they look expectantly unto him. That's seeking his face. And they were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. So there was a response. They moved towards the Lord in a desire to hear from him, to see him, to behold his glory. They were radiant. That is, what he gave them caused them to shine. Remember Moses in the presence of the Lord. And then it says, their faces were not ashamed. They got what they desired of the Lord and were radiant. Thank you, brethren. <clears throat> we have two more questions. And uh, the first is in John's Gospel, chapter 20. If you turn to that, please. I'd like to read those scriptures. John's Gospel, chapter 20, and verse 22. So, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. In verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23, whosoever's sin ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So there are two parts to this question. The first is in uh, verse 22. The reception of the Holy Ghost, is this the same as in Acts chapter 2? If not, what is it then? So here in, in John 20, 22, he breathed on them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Is this the same as Acts chapter two, that's Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came down? If it's not the same, the question is, what is it then? And lastly, keep this in mind, verse 23, please explain it by giving examples. And just keep an eye on the time. We have just about five minutes left. OK, thank you. Uh, first, verse 22 is not the same as Acts 2. Uh, he said, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye Holy Ghost. The article is not there. And the only time the word breathed is mentioned, as far as I know, is when he breathed in Adam in Genesis, the, uh, Genesis chapter 2, and verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And here the same God, God and man in one, the Lord Jesus Christ, after resurrection, well, first he breathed in the dust and it became a living soul. And now he is breathing in them his own life, 
the life of the risen Lord, the new man, the second man, not like the first man. He is breathing in them a new life, the life of resurrection. And it is not giving them, as it said in the Holy Ghost when he, when he came down and he formed the church of God with all believers. No. He is breathing them the life of resurrection, the risen Lord. Um, one more verse in First Corinthians 15. Did I pass the five minutes? No, that's okay. okay. That's not First Corinthians 15 and verse 50. Which verse? 45? Yeah. yeah, thank you. How do you know? <laughs> and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last man a quickening spirit. Quickened them. He gave them a new life, the life of resurrection. Is that all? What, what's the second one? Uh, explain verse 23. Yeah, verse 23, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. And that is, of course, on the earth. We can uh, uh, remember, for instance, what the apostle said to the Corinthians regarding the man that was sinning in chapter 5. He said, you and my spirit were gathered, have judged that this man would be delivered unto Satan for the destruction uh, of the body, but the soul may be saved. And then in chapter 2 of Second Corinthians, here they restored him back. So that's what it is. It is when you remit it, it is remitted. When you hold it against him, it is held against him. Not forgiving sins in eternity. Even the Jews know this. Said, no one can forgive sins but God. Yes, only the Lord Jesus can. But here it is forgiving them, forgiving uh, the company of believers can hold the sin on a person. And you'll be registered in heaven. You'd hold it on him. As he would be subject to chastisement of the Lord until he repents. So it is not forgiving him. It is the parental forgiven, you can say. But it's not parental. It's the assembly forgiven gathered unto him. He gave the same thing to Peter, but it is to the assembly, when they are gathered together, they can hold the sin on a brother or a sister, would be approved in heaven. Again, not eternal forgiveness. I can think, for instance, of Peter, Ananias and Sapphira. You know, he, he told them, you have, you have sinned against the Holy Spirit. And they died instantly. He held it against them. We can't do this now. This was a, an apostolic. Uh, we can't let one die. But they lied against the Holy Spirit, and it was the bright testimony then, the beginning of the church. So God thought that this has to be punished, and it was held against them. Ananias died and his wife Sapphira dies. And also, in 1 Corinthians 11, there are many are sickly, and many weak, and many shall die, many sleep. That is also holding against them when the assembly is gathered and they can hold the sin against the person. Thank you. Sorry about that. Too clumsy. I just
just wanted to, to come back to the, the thing of breathing. Um, the observation in this situation, I think, was that the Lord Jesus was breathing on a small circle of persons, the disciples who were gathered together at that time. And I would suggest it was in preparation for what would come at Pentecost, because Pentecost was universal, right? We see the same thing in the scripture that said, says every word of God it is God putting forth something that will be universally available for all mankind. That is what happens at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was given to all believers. So it is universally available. Here it's not a, a universal availability, but it is the Lord preparing them for what would come later because he would tell them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait because then he would, he would go away, but he would send the Holy Spirit who would replace him universally. So I would suggest that that's the difference. Sorry. Beloved saints, thank you for your patience. We have just one more, and then we'll have our coffee break. And the question is this, can someone have rest without repentance? I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to edit this a little bit. Can someone have rest without repentance? And we'll close off on that question. Our discussion mention was made of David and his sin with Uriah's wife. And reference was made to Psalm 51 and also Psalm 32. We know that in between when he did the deed and the coming of Nathan to him about a year passed. And if we read in Psalm 32, verse 3, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Verse 5, I acknowledge my sin, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgive us the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters it shall not come nigh unto thee. It took him a little while, well not a little while, it took him some time to get to the point of confessing his sin. And as these verses tell us, he didn't have rest. This brings us to the end of our question period. Thank the brethren for the questions. We also thank the Lord for the answers that were given. Brother Nader is going to lead us in singing in our next session. Would you, do you mind if I borrow five minutes off the singing? <laughs> we'll return at 4.05. So have a coffee break until 4.05. We'll take five minutes off. Uh, Nader's singing. Please return, though. Please return at 4.05. Thank you very much, brethren. <laughs>